Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the final installment in the making of series of this sculpture. Now if you've followed the series for a while you'll know that it's been named PT. This was always a code name, a shorthand for what would eventually be the actual name and sadly or luckily I guess I came up with a better name. A name that I prefer over the original and so now the entire series will have to have its name changed to the new name of the sculpture, which is Empyrean. And we'll return to this name change and why I did a little bit later. But for now, if you're looking for more videos from this series, just search for Empyrean. This episode, I think I'd like to speak about clay application and finishing the surface of a sculpture. It's what most of the footage is going to be about anyway. And it will all be in real time this time around, so no time lapses, always real time footage. 20% of the work takes 80% of the time, according to the Pareto distribution principle. I find this holds true in sculpture. We'll talk about the name change the sculpture underwent, why I decided to change it. I'll talk about what it means to see a piece of sculpture through to the end, what this sculpture means to me, and why I made it. Having edited this video, I have to say that I find it immensely relaxing to watch clay being applied this way and at this tempo. It's very slow and methodical, and it's quite nice and therapeutic to watch, I think. I hope you agree, and that you watch the video. In this video, you'll see me, for the most part, using two main tools. One tool is a Kemper loop tool, and the other is a Taranti wood tool. I'll leave links to Taranti and to the complete sculptor, where you can get Kemper loop tools in the description below. The Taranti wood tool you can possibly make for yourself, just out of a wooden stick and, and using sandpaper and knives. I use some other tools here and there, but for the most part it's going to be the Kemper tool and the Taranti wood tool. At this point, the clay surface on my sculpture is quite hard. It's almost leather-like in toughness at this stage. I prefer it this way because nothing that I've established is going to get mushed around while applying the last little bit of clay when it's as hard as this. But it's not so dry that it's cracking, or that fresh clay won't stick to the surface. It's a delicate balance and a skill only patience and perseverance will provide you with. Other sculptors will prefer a different feel to their clay. It's an individual preference for sure, so experiment and find what suits you. At this very moment, I'm going to derail a little from our actual conversation and we'll come back to tools and finishing the surface in a few minutes. I want to talk about the value of experience. The only way to get experience sculpting is to sculpt. I get a lot of messages from people asking technical questions about sculpture, how to begin, etc, etc. And no amount of asking questions will provide you with the experience and skill that you build up through sculpting. You have to sculpt. And you don't need much to do it. I sculpted for years in my 45 square meter apartment's bedroom on a desk and before that in my bedroom at my parents' house. It doesn't matter what kind of facilities you have, make do with what you have. Practice is everything. Speaking of practice, you have to practice to get a sculpture to a level where you can begin considering finishing it to this stage. I probably have over 200 working hours on this sculpture before I started doing the kind of work that you're watching me doing right here in this video. Now the question always comes up, how do you finish your sculpture? How do you finish the surface of your clay? And do you have to finish a sculpture like this or like this? And the answer is, of course not. You can choose the way you want to, to finish the surface of your sculpture. This is just one of many ways, all of which is potentially valid. Having said that, I do implore you to consider why. The why is always vital. Friedrich Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Perhaps that's a little heavy when talking about finishing sculptures, but planning what the sculpture will eventually be made into, what material you are planning to cast it in, what patina or colors you are planning for it, is vital, I believe, to how you finish the surface of your sculpture in clay. And even before that, what is the subject? Does a beautiful young woman need the same surface treatment as an old man? Perhaps they should be different. Why? How? And if you choose one finish over another, why? 
the man who has a why can bear any hand. Give yourself reasons for your choices. Don't make arbitrary decisions with no well-considered thoughts behind them. And this is something to consider throughout the entire process. To begin with, the why will give you the idea for your sculpture. The why will provide you with the correct answers to the question your sculpture brings up that are not directly linked to the model. And the why will give you all the motivation you need to finish the piece after having spent months and months and torturing yourself trying to make it the best sculpture you've ever made. The why will always be there for you. Let's return to the technical aspect of sculpture and let me speak briefly on a sculptural technique, an ancient practice developed in the East. You'll see me using it again and again while applying clay with my Toronti wood tool. And the technique is called the dragon roll. Kind of like the piece of sushi with shrimp, cucumber and avocado. You know the one, the dragon roll. The dragon roll technique in sculpture is an application technique. The name does not come from the Far East. I mean, actually, in a way it does. It comes from the woods of Berwick in eastern Pennsylvania. And it came to me by the way of my instructor, Mitch Shea, who most likely coined the term. It's not as interesting as it sounds at first. It's not drag and roll, but a drag and a roll. You drag the piece of clay while you slowly roll the tool at the same time. It's a short motion and it should not happen over long distances. And for me, it's the ultimate way to apply clay late in the process. There's a few tricks to it that I'll share with you, just to make sure you don't stray from the path of the dragon roll. You need to use short motions, not longer motions. They do not look good. You have to vary the direction a bit. Go with the form, then against the form, like you would while cross-hatching when doing pen and ink drawings. Longer motions, all going in the same direction, tends to look like the sculpture has been rained on for centuries, which is not a great look in my opinion. But as I mentioned before, surface finish is up to each individual sculptor. Give the dragon roll a try. You'll be surprised by the power of this ancient Eastern technique. quick word from our sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online video learning platform where you can learn virtually anything, from baking to photography to painting. My viewers get a two-month trial for free, so if you're interested in learning something new, click the Skillshare link in the description below and sign up. When you look at these close-up, you'll see that in actuality, even though my surface seems smooth from a distance, it's not that smooth. And let me quickly speak on why. My ideal finish, what I envision this sculpture being turned into, is bronze. That's the material I'm going for, even though I can't afford it. Bronze castings have, usually have, patinas applied to them. And there are many colors and many ways to patina a sculpture. I'm not gonna get into that. But a surface with a bit of breakup in it, a bit of texture to it, even if it's a light one, will take a patina in a very interesting way, I think. If the patina is the right one, of course textured surface kind of forces the patina into randomized patterns. It tends to build up a little bit in the crevices, often leading to something that looks a little bit rusty-esque, which, which I quite like a lot. It looks natural. And of course the type of patina applied plays a huge role here. Not all patinas are going to get the same results. There is another reason I have an ever so slightly textured finish. And that is that skin is not smooth like plastic or polished metal. The light bounces off the skin in a certain way because of the pores, the hair, the color variety in the skin and the translucency of skin. And the way light bounces off the flesh I think is best represented by leaving your clay surface slightly textured. We've spoken about deciding where on the spectrum of hyper real to visual impression your sculpture exists. In some cases, I'll lean towards rendering and realism, and in other areas of my sculpture, I'll lean towards the visual impression. When it comes to the surface, the skin, I lean towards visual impression. I want my sculpture's surface to feel like skin, yet not be sculpted realistically like skin. 
because I don't think that looks so good. Contrasting materials also plays a role in how I finish my surface. Muscle and bone are the materials that exist underneath our skin, and I want to create the impression that muscle and bone exists beneath the surface of my sculpture as well. There are many ways to go about achieving this, and I do my best to employ as many of them as possible. It begins with contrasting the way bones and muscles are designed. The bones should be more symmetrical, more angular. There's also the contrast in the way bones and flesh carry their weight. Most muscles will, if broken down into straight lines to describe the curve of the muscle, have a longer line towards the top and shorter lines towards the bottom. And this speaks of weight. The muscles is flesh and it's sagging under its own weight. Think of areas in the contour where this is obvious, like the buttocks or the chest muscles. Bones, however, do not sag under their own weight. And so when the curve of bones are broken down into straight lines, it stands to reason that they will contrast the way the curve of the muscles was formed. Essentially meaning that they're not sagging, that there's not long lines towards the top and short lines at the bottom of the curve. And lastly, bone and muscle contrast each other in texture. The skin is often stretched tightly over the surface of a bone, while over muscle it's not stretched tightly to the same extent. Think of how often you've seen orange peel skin texture or cellulite on the skin covering the clavicle. It, it just doesn't happen. So where bones run close to the surface, I try to make the clay surface of my sculpture a little bit smoother, suggesting that there are hard bones running right underneath the surface of the skin. You want to find as many things to contrast as you can in a sculpture. Contrast contraction versus extension active versus relaxed. Contrast is key in any sculpture. This, I think, is a good time to mention Patreon. If you are interested in learning sculpture from me personally and get feedback on your work either on email or via video chat, Patreon is the place for you. You'll get in-depth feedback on techniques and how you can apply them to your own work. Anything sculpture related goes, we can talk about armature, supplies, mold making, anything you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out, there's a link in the description below. Those of you who follow me on Instagram will have seen that the name of the sculpture changed, or at least that the series is not named the same as the sculpture is named. Well, that has changed, and the name of the series is now the same as the sculpture, which is Imperium. The original name of the sculpture was going to be Pythagoras Theorem, based on the position of the arms and how some of the spacecrafts NASA sent into space contained plaques with mathematical information so that a potentially intelligent species who would find it would understand that we were a civilization who understood universal language of the universe, which is math. The position of the arms create a right-angled triangle indicating that the figure speaks the universal language of math, a language an intelligent alien would or should at least also be fluent in, if they're capable of space travel. Now this references Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos, where the ancient alien creatures are similar to gods and they're worshipped in the same way. Who we worship or pray to is not really something heavily considered in my sculpture, but I thought the inclusion of some Lovecraftian references would be interesting. I love leaving hints like this in my work, and perhaps nobody will ever notice. Now, obviously, some of you will notice, since I'm telling you, but perhaps people not watching this video will never notice, but I will make contact with some. But I ended up moving on from that name idea because I thought there was a better name that better described what I wanted to say with this piece. And that kind of evolved as I worked through the sculpture and slowly discover what the sculpture is about. In ancient cosmologies, the Empyrean was the highest place in heaven, occupied by fire and God. And so it fits perfectly, I think, with what I wanted to say with this piece. Now, before I start, there are so many references and thoughts 
weaved into my work that it's hard to speak about it and not sound like a person who should be locked up in an asylum. I, I recognize that all this stuff sounds a little bit crazy, but bear with me here for a few moments and I'll try and be brief. The arms, the right-angled triangle, the Pythagoras theorem, is ultimately about prayer and the psychological reason for prayer, even though it's wrapped up in this Lovecraftian call for alien gods. It doesn't really matter who you pray to in the end, which I suppose is why I chose to do it in a way that my figure ends up praying to no one, or at least no one that we normally pray to. It's the act of praying that is the important part. Prayer is, at its core, asking a question. A question you have carried within you. The prayer forces you to voice that question, to put words behind a vague thought. Putting words behind the thought shapes it, forms it into something that occupies the real world. It solidifies the thought and makes it real. When it's no longer a vague thought, the question, fully formed, can now be answered. And to ask the question, to formulate the question, is the hard part. Students who write down their academic goals do better in university. Athletes who write down concrete goals do better. It's the same principle applied. Without a goal, you can't really score. The goal is the question. The answer is often a lot more obvious once the question has been asked. Which coincidentally correlates very, very well to the way that I was taught and now teach sculpture. Every piece of clay applied should be an answer to a question observed from a distance. Which is pretty meta, right? I made a sculpture about making sculptures, in a way. Of course, there's more to it than just making a sculpture about making sculptures. But as I said, my ideas are weaving here and there and everywhere when it comes to this stuff. I guess the biggest thing I wanted to say with this piece was to reach for the highest heaven, the highest goal, if you will. Take aim and shoot. Ask the questions, you'll be able to answer them, and once answered, you will be able to execute. If you enjoyed the video and want to learn sculpture from me, check out my Patreon page. I give feedback and critiques on people's work and we talk about whatever you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out, the link is in the description below. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for a new video next Thursday. Hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever a new video comes out. If you enjoyed the video, Click the like button and share with your friends and family. It really helps me out a lot. Thank you so much for watching the final installment in this series. Now just for reference, it took me 6 months and over 300 hours to sculpt this figure. So I really really hope you liked the piece.
Thank you for watching. Stay creative. And I hope to see you in the next one.